It's Dr. Alan Blum, director of the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. I, I've got the privilege of talking to Dr. David Fletcher, who I once knew and, and corresponded with and, and who is a part of our exhibition uh, dedicated to uh, Larry Flint takes on the tobacco industry. But I, I'd like him to introduce himself and, and what he's doing now and go back and tell us more about the story of how that article got there. Sure, Alan. Thank you for having me on today. Um, I'm David Fletcher. I'm a full-time practicing physician. I uh, practice in Champaign, Illinois. Um, I am an occupational medicine physician, and i uh, just glad to be able to kind of tell this tale of uh, something in my past that I'm proud of uh, that certainly has a lot of irony uh, considering the profession I'm in that somehow the medical community <clears throat> wouldn't withstand the pressure of tobacco. So in um, 1981, was it, or 82, did you contact JAMA or did they contact the Journal of the American Medical Association or did they contact you? And Gail McBride was the editor of the news section. Well, I contacted them. I uh, uh, was in my residency in, in occupational and preventive medicine, which was uh, a program the U.S. Army had, and I had um, just finished my training for my master's in public health degree at the University of California at Berkeley, and <clears throat> that's when I got exposed about this film, Death in the West, that was a very controversial documentary about the dangers of smoking and, you know, the, the, in contrast to the myths of commercials that had been set up by the tobacco industry. And I had befriended a professor named Stan Glantz who had gotten a bootleg copy of this and was able to convince a local PBS station in San Francisco to air it. And I was just fascinated by the story. And it was a great film. It was one of the best anti-smoking documentaries ever. And I really felt that it was something that uh, the medical community had to be aware of and that in my zealous uh, belief that physicians' role in the anti-smoking crusade is an essential function of what we do as doctors, I really wanted to promote this film as part of my responsibility, especially as a public health physician. Yeah, the um, the, the film itself was uh, effectively banned in America because Philip Morris, which was the subject of the film, uh, they they gathered together old cowboys um, and uh, they showed, they juxtaposed them to old Marlboro commercials and showed these cowboys with uh, emphysema and lung cancer and interviewed their physicians. Um, and Philip Morris had an injunction uh, against having that film shown again. And so literally it was banned both in England where it was made and uh, also in the United States. And somehow Dr. Glantz got a copy and you had heard about it, and uh, then you you wanted to write about it. I wanted to write about it. Um, I had gone to the editorial offices in Chicago. I went to medical school at Rush. Um, I always had a big interest in medical journalism and writing, and so I was considering applying for a fellowship that JAMA had on uh, medical journalism, and that's when I befriended the editor, and that's when I pitched the story and, you know, they were excited about it and, you know, got him a copy of the film. And, you know, I had just left that position. I was the Fishbein Fellow for 7980 at JAMA. I'm and well I, aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't get it the first time I applied. And it, it's a whole other story about yeah. life at the American Medical Association. There's certain things you don't want to see, such as sausages and, and laws being made and also the insides of a medical society. I've worked for three of them. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, you wrote this piece, and, and what happened? Well, you know, I was getting all excited about the piece, uh, you know, coming out. It was going to be uh, in early August of 82 in the Journal of American Medical Association. Uh, I thought it would probably get some national exposure, which I wanted to happen because the, the word about the film needed to get out. And I was very excited about it. And... Uh, I was very comfortable with the piece that I wrote, very proud of uh, of the article. And, um, you know, suddenly a few days before it was to appear, um, I got a letter from the editor 
uh, stating that um, they're going to kill the story. And um, they thought it was too controversial. And, you know, Philip Morris, they're afraid of getting sued, all the various different stuff. So got a letter uh, sent to my home and it was very disheartening. Yeah, you don't by any chance still have a copy of that. Well, I do have a copy of the letter. I think you have it in your exhibit. I think you have uh, the letter I have is one of your links on the uh, on Okay, the page. I just want to make sure that's the same one that you got from JAMA. That's the same letter I got from JAMA, yes. And um, then uh, you, you, you as as we all do when we get rejected, you, you, you um, held your breath and you thought about it for a while and somehow it made its way to an entirely different publication. It did, it did. It, it made itself to a different publication. Um, basically, um, I was looking for an outlet that would be somewhat sensational because it, of the article being placed where it was at, and also consistent with the theme that that particular publication had in regards to cigarette advertising. Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's a great story. And they they grabbed it. They grabbed it. They grabbed it. Um, not something I've put on my CV, but <laughs> the tension. I think I'm going to put it back on the uh, on my CV, and 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 when I do a lot of my depositions with attorneys, be prepared to answer. Well, I, you know, I think it's important. I, John Banzaf, um, who is one of the found, well, he founded the group called Action on Smoking and Health. He also happened to work for a free speech organization, uh, which. Uh, uh, was was a lot of scatological material that he fought for. And I know that when he was cross-examined in, in various cases uh, on smoking, uh, they they would ask him about his other work. But um, Flint, as you've seen in the exhibition uh, that I learned about, uh, was a rather controversial figure in that I came to the conclusion that his war on smoking was mainly directed at, at revenge for uh, Brown and Williamson having canceled its advertisements that he had practically given them for nothing and assumed that they were going to continue to be an advertiser. So I don't think it turns out that there are that many heroes in the story. You may be the only one. <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, uh, I didn't know about uh, what Larry Flint's true position was until I you know, looked through the exhibition about that. But uh, regardless, he, he did have a lot of impact what he did. And it, and I, and I think that's still something that that publication should be proud of, that there may have been different motivation in the beginning. But they did continue to, um, you know, publish these anti-smoking um, uh, advertisements that they ran in the publication to an audience that, you know, typically, you know, wouldn't be uh, a target for those type of uh, anti-smoking uh, advertisements or documentaries or or public service announcements. That's right. There wasn't much else. There was just Mad Magazine, basically. And I m once met with Bill Gaines and, and Al Feldstein to urge them to do more of those parodies of cigarette ads. But Larry Flint went one step beyond. And I think that um, he did continue them. Uh, he also was well ahead of the guy at Princeton who wrote that book called uh, On BS. And uh, Flint... Uh, really handed it to everybody. And he I don't think he ever uh, held back from uh, his criticisms of people that deserved it. I well, want to thank, well, go right ahead. I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, I'm proud that the article was in Hustler because, uh, it, you know, he was willing to give it the light of the day after it had been spiked. And, you know, there was some controversy that came out when it had been spiked, uh, which the AMA ended up denying that it, about, it was political pressures that they killed the article. I mean, they never gave me an explanation except to being controversial. And, you know, a couple of years later, Sun Times reporter Howard Winsky was able to really uncover what really happened. And um, I think that was important to get out there. And it's it it, it just uh, shows some uh, hypocrisy. The organization, which I've been a member with since 1977, still a member, uh, exhibited back in the early 80s. Yeah, we have another exhibition, by the way, called The Unfiltered Truth, How the AMA Rewrote Tobacco History. I hope you'll take a look at that. But, you know, I, I will say this. We did include the memo that George Lundberg, the editor, sent out to his staff that there were particularly sensitive issues that the board of trustees were concerned about and that executive vice president James Sammons and publisher uh, Tom Hannon were very concerned about. And the three issues were 
uh, tobacco use and prevention uh, and or tobacco cessation and prevention and uh, uh, abortion and nuclear war. Uh, I don't know how those three are related, but uh, to George's credit, uh, we, we, we never saw eye to eye back then when I was doing my theme issues against smoking while he was writing memos like that. But um, we eventually became friends and uh, he's a, an alumnus of the University of Alabama. So we stay in touch and he comes for football games every now and then and parks in my driveway. I look forward oh. to uh, continuing our dialogue. Uh, we have a lot in common, uh, both from Larry Flint and also uh, George Lumberg and, and, and a lot of your other background. I look forward also to hosting you for future Art of Medicine rounds on baseball. Well, that'll be a lot of fun. So thank you so much, Alan. And, and, your, and your new book. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, David.